Hi. Um, welcome to uh, the maintainer's track, uh, SIG Scheduling Deep Dive. My name is Aldo Cookie Condor. I work for uh, GKE. I'm based in, in Waterloo, Canada. And uh, I'm uh, in the Kubernetes side of things. I'm a maintainer uh, and TL for SIG Scheduling. Um, yeah, my name is Kent. I um, work, uh, work for the Dark Cloud based in Shanghai, China, and I also work on upstream, uh, uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes upstream uh, together with Eldo and uh, mainly on SIG schedule. Yeah. So we're going to have a quick uh, overview of scheduler for all uh, for the ones who are not familiar, and the remaining is all about updates uh, in the various projects that the SIG scheduling hosts. Um, scheduler, so let's start with the scheduler. Um, the scheduler uh, is a single component, uh, it's, it's a controller in the, in the in part of the control plane, the Kubernetes control plane, um, and it's basically watching for uh, pods, uh, which can be in the high level in two, state, in two states. They could be admitted or scheduled, uh, scheduled pods, Pods that are already assigned to nodes, and pods that are new, they, they were not assigned to nodes yet. So the, the pods that are not assigned yet, they will go into a scheduling queue, and the pods that are scheduled will go into the, uh, the internal scheduler cache. Uh, once, uh, once at a time, uh, we pop uh, a pod from the, from the queue, um, and then we we execute all the scheduling algorithms to find first where the pod can fit, uh, and among all the possibilities, wh which one is the best option according to the configuration, uh, and whether we need to preempt any existing pods uh, in the um, I that are running because we have a higher priority pod. So if it's scalable. Uh, it will enter the binding process, which is simply telling the API server that we, uh, the pod is already scheduled uh, and where where it should go. Um, if it doesn't, it will just uh, will go back to the queue. Um, and even if uh, if it doesn't, it will get a notification. Uh, it will get a pod condition which says not scalable, and other components can react to it, such as the cluster autoscaler, for example. Uh, if the binding is successful, then that's all that the kubescaler does. Uh, at that, from from the point the the the, no, the pod has a, a node assigned to it, scheduler no longer owns the pod. So anything that happens to it uh, is responsibility of the kubelet, except for preemption, uh, which is when we need uh, to to schedule a higher priority pod. Um, so, uh, over the years, we worked in a, in a framework to make scheduler more extensible uh, because obviously different companies, different users have different needs. So we, uh, we needed to, uh, to establish a structure where people can contribute uh, more easily to the scheduler. So uh, and as, as a result of that, we introduced a series of uh, extension points uh, where, where uh, people can, um, can uh, extend the scheduler. Uh, let's, let's start in the green box, uh, the, the scheduling cycle. Um, there are basically two, two main processes here, uh, pre-filter and filter. Uh, filters are all about yes or no. So uh, we take a no, we take a pod, we take a a node, uh, and we ask the question: Does can this go in here? Yes or no? Um, so we do that process. If we ended up with all nodes for all for all the nodes, then we trigger the post filter, which uh, the typical example is the preemption uh, uh, mechanism that would evict some pods. If we have a set of uh, if we have a set of if we have more than one node that can fit, that responded yes to the filters, uh, then we enter the scoring phase where we run a score for each of the nodes, uh, multiple scores for each of the nodes, and whichever node has the highest score is the one that is uh, uh, selected. 
and then we enter the binding cycle on the right, uh, which communicates the decisions to uh, API server. Somewhere in here, there is uh, mechanisms to uh, uh, to do volume binding as well, um, but uh, I won't get into those details. Uh, now, we have introduced this new box uh, on the left, the purple box, uh, which is a new uh, a new uh, extension point which we call pre enqueue uh, which it, it, what what it means is it will uh, hold every hold any pod uh, from from all of the rest uh, from the rest of the the, um, the mechanisms uh, of the scheduler. Uh, why is this useful? Well, uh, Kant uh, will will give us some some insight of that. But this is a new extension point that you can you can tweak. Um, the big difference between pre enqueue and filter, let's say, is that pre enqueue is a global decision; it's a decision for the cluster. Uh, filter is a decision for the node. Um, and also, uh, if you are failing the pre enqueue, you're not even entering the queue. So uh, it's as as if your pod didn't exist, kind of. Um, so. If your pod fails the pre enqueue, for example, the cluster autoscaler won't scale up. Uh, that's that's uh, one of the difference with filter. If a pod fails filters, then the cluster autoscaler can still react to it. Um, I will see why is that useful in a second. Okay, let's go through several updates and improvements we made in the last several releases. So, the first one. As Edo said, is the uh, pod scheduling readiness. So uh, for most of the time, when pods are created, they will be added to the scheduling queue and uh, popped out of the queue one by one uh, for scheduling. So this makes sense for most of the time, but not always the case. Like uh, if the pod missed the essential uh, resources, let's take a pod request for GPU for example. So if the GPU hasn't been registered in the cluster, then the pod will never be scheduled successfully, right? Uh, also, in, uh, like in a quota manager system, and uh, let's say uh, the pod, a pod with a lower priority, and it will, uh, there may be some scenarios like uh, there is not enough resources for the pod. So the pod will still be stuck in pending for a period of time. However, the group scheduler will a committed to reschedule the pod when it when it gets the chance, so it's, it somehow will lead to the uh, integration of the scheduling uh, throughput. Uh, uh, throughput. So, uh, although we have some like uh, uh, just, uh, uh, me mechanism underlying, like uh, we have the like uh, we have the uh, back off alg algorithm, which we are handling for the pod schedule. Uh, for scheduling failures, but it will, but we cannot avoid it, right? So for another case, it's about the, uh, let's say we have several customer controllers who wants to make the decision together with the scheduler, but it does not need, but, but it does not want to modify the default group schedule. So without this feature, we cannot achieve this. So we need a knob to help us uh, control the scheduling process. That's the general idea of this uh, cap. So, uh, we in this in this new feature, we introduced a new field named uh, scheduling gates. It's a set of strings. So, when the group scheduler found a pod carries the scheduling gates, it will never pop out the pod for scheduling. And this is an uh, example about how this feature works. Uh, let's say we have uh, normal Kubernetes, and we have a customer webhook and an external controller. So when we apply a pod, the pod will send the request to the API server and uh, invoking the webhook. Then the webhook will inject the scheduling gates to the pod. At the same time, the group scheduler watches the, the pod create event and it found the pod carries the scheduling gates, so it will never pop out the pod. Then came the external controller. It, oh sorry. Uh, it's responsible. It, it's, it's for like removing the uh, feature gates when it found the pod is ready. Like uh, 
uh, the, uh, we, we have enough resources for the pod in the quantum manager system. So the external control will try to remove the scheduling pods and uh, the Cooper scheduler will watch the pod update event and it found the scheduling gates was removed so it will pop out the pod. And uh, yes, when entering into the normal scheduling process, that's how it works in general. And the next step is about uh, the uh, mutable scheduling directives for suspended jobs. So the motivation for this is in batch jobs, usually pods will run with specific constraints, like they will run in the same zone, maybe for the communication performance, or they, pre uh, they prefer some uh, same model of GPUs. So job hopes to uh, be mutable when, uh, when it's uh, suspended. And also, a high-level job control, uh, job queuing control, uh, can, can take advantage of this feature for better pause placements. Let's say, uh, let's look at the right, uh, maybe right side of the slide. So, this, these are all the mutable fields we support right now: the so node affinity, node selector, durations, annotations, labels, and the scheduling gates. The scheduling gates was in, was introduced in the last release. 1.27. So we didn't introduce any new APIs in this feature. We just relax the API validations. So you see when the job is suspended, we can inject these scheduling gates. And also Q uh, is a sub project mostly uh, sponsored by the scheduling take advantage, takes advantage of this feature for job queuing. So the next feature is about uh, the uh, mutable pod scheduling directives when pod gated. So it's quite similar to the previous one, but it's for pod only. And yes, the motivation is quite similar. So the external workload controllers can influence the pod placement with this feature. Uh, the, the general idea is when, when we found a pod is uh, gated by the scheduling gates, then we can inject the node selector and the node affinity. But one thing I want to highlight here is not any node selector or node affinity is allowed here because uh, we, uh, 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 at the high level, so if the node selector or node affinity is empty, then anything is okay. But if not, only more restricted updates are allowed. That means uh, the, the node candidates should be a subset of the orange nodes. Yeah. So if, if you have some uh, uh, customer jobs which has no suspended semantics, so you can also achieve the same behavior as a Kubernetes native job with this feature. Uh, then the pod to bridge spread plugin. <laughs> so this plugin helps to control pods spreading across all the con uh, clusters. And we did a lot of work in the past several releases but I, want, uh, but, but, but I will not go into that detail because we already did that in the last KubeCon North America. So the first one is about the uh, main domains. It's a new field in, under the tuplage spread constraints. So it helps to control the uh, minimum number of tuplage domains. And if there is not enough domains, the cluster uh, autoscaler will get it on board until there are enough amounts. And uh, the second is about uh, uh, two new fields, node affinity policy and node tent policy. So we can use these two fields to uh, define whether we should respect the node affinity or node tent when calculating the spreading skew. So all these three fields are under the uh, to predict spread constraints. And another feature is about uh, the loading updates. So in the before, when a deployment is loading update. Because the Kubernetes scheduler cannot distinguish with the old replicas and the new replicas. So when the old ones tear down, the state will fall into an unbalanced state. <laughs> one solution for this is we can deploy the, the scheduler at the same time. <laughs> then well, if we with this feature enabled, there is another approach right now. So, 
Uh, this feature introduced a new field named mesh label keys here. Uh, it's a set of the label keys, and uh, it, it will not care about the label values. So uh, for template, we can deploy a pod template hash here. So the pod template hash is a label added by the deployed controller. So its child replica sets will not overlap with each other. And, and, and yes, and then the cool schedule can use this use this uh, label keys to distinguish with the old ones and the new ones, and uh, will follow into a balanced scheduling results. That's how it works generally. And yes, we just uh, uh, I, I think we the blog about these three caps was just uh, uh, published uh, yesterday, so you can. If you have, if you want to know more information about this, you can click the link for the details. Yeah. And besides these features, we have several notable improvements. I listed three here. So, the first one is about the skip status. Uh, so, uh, if uh, if if a pod has nothing to do with a filter filter plugin then we think the filter plugin can be skipped directly, right? Let's take a, let's take an example like a pod carries no node affinity fields. <laughs> then the pod, uh, then the node affinity plugin will have nothing to do with the pod. So the plugin can be skipped directly, right? Now we can return a skip status in the pre-filter extending point and the corresponding filter plugin can be skipped. Uh, it can be skipped. Uh, the second is quite similar to the previous one, but it's for the score extension point. So you can also return a uh, skip status in the pre-score extension point to skip the score plugin. Yeah. The next one is about a new metric uh, plugin evaluation total. So, if uh, if if uh, if one plugin is being called, the value of the metric will plus one. So, with this plugin, we can have a, have an overview of how your plugins inflect in, in the scheduling results. I think it's it's quite useful. And then I hand I hand it over to Eldo for several several projects updates. Yes. So, uh, as Sig Scheduling, we, our main component, of course, is the Keep Scheduler, but we also host a few sub-projects. Um, the first one is uh, kind of, all, not the newest, but uh, one of the newest uh, sub-projects. Uh, it's a, a sub-component, it's a, a controller uh, for uh, job queuing. So, we, we offer uh, resource quota management uh, with uh, borrowing and preemption semantics um, at the job level. Um, it also has uh, support for resource fungibility, meaning that uh, if you have an heterogeneous cluster, uh, then you can you can uh, establish quotas for different uh, resources for different flavors uh, we call them in the cluster, and then you can if you submit a job. Uh, Q will decide if it fits in the in, in certain quota, it will assign to that flavor, otherwise it will assign to the next one that has available quota. Uh, we directly uh, support the job API uh, that we offer uh, support for uh, for MPI job as well, Qflow, and we are working on more integrations. Um, we also uh, published uh, a library uh, for supporting any custom job CRD that you might have. Um, so you, you can uh, queue, with, queue it with queue. Um, here, uh, you might be wondering, uh, why are we uh, scaling uh, investing in a new uh, scheduling uh, uh, project? Um, and the answer is that we are not. We, we are not reinventing Cube Scheduler. We, uh, we are following a separation of, con of concerns principle. So Q can take decisions at the job level. Um, so it's a f like, let's, let's call it a first scheduler. And once the decision has been taken for the entire job, 
uh, we uh, delegate the rest of the scheduling to the rest the existing components. So Q, so Q is compatible with Cube Scheduler. It's compatible with Controller Manager, and it's also compatible with Cluster Autoscaler. Uh, and uh, so we just released uh, the version 0 0.3. Uh, I think it was last week. Um, and some of the highlights, we, uh, we released the first uh, beta quality API, meaning that from now on we will respect uh, the deprecation policy established by Kubernetes. Um, we increased uh, some validation for better use. Uh, we added preemption support. That was a big uh, request from our users. And um, we finally have it for, for, different, uh, for different scenarios. We added support for MPI job, uh, the V1 beta 2 version of it. Uh, we added this optional sequential admission uh, for quasi uh, all or nothing, organ scheduling, if you will. Uh, we added support for uh, limit ranges and runtime classes so we can better calculate uh, usage, uh, quota usage. And we, uh, as I said, uh, we published this library for integrating any CRD uh, with Q. If you want to learn more, we did a session yesterday um, uh, on, during the batch and HPC day. Um, so you can find a link in the slides. Uh, hopefully, the recording will be up uploaded soon. Uh, another project that we, we host as SIG Scheduling is the, um, the D Scheduler component, which uh, they just released, uh, they just got a new logo. Um, so. What is new in this scheduler? Uh, first of all, they introduced the, the V1 Alpha 2 API and the D-Scheduler framework, which uh, is kind of a similar, uh, similar framework to the scheduler framework. Um, it's, it's a plugin-based plug refactor of, of the, the project, so more people can more easily collaborate without, without bumping into each other's features. Uh, there is a new config API uh, the V1 Alpha 1 is deprecated, and uh, now they also introduce these scheduler profiles, similar as well to the to the scheduler profiles in Cube Scheduler. Uh, I'll expa expand on this a little bit in a bit, um, and they added uh, this uh, feature for the node utilization plugin, and now they have a namespace filter. Uh, one inspiring thing that they wanted to share is that they had more than 10 contributors in the uh, latest release. So the discover framework, well, what is the motivation that the project was becoming too big, too many contributors, uh, hopefully some of you here. Um, so, and they uh, all wanted to introduce new features, new strategies, and they were, they were having uh, issues uh, merging those changes. So they decided to uh, follow a similar pattern to keep scheduler, uh, introduce the the this, this scheduler framework. It works a little different uh, from the scheduler framework, mm, and also a few different names. So let's say we have a profile here. Each pod is um, each pod is uh, passed through all of these plugins. Each plugin implements resource sort and filter, and they go through it. Uh, there are two types of uh, plugins, the disk schedule, which is kind of like uh, observing one node at a time, or sorry, one pod at a time, uh, and you have the balance, which are, is observing kind of like the entire cluster uh, at a time to take decisions. So this could take decisions about, let's say, how long a pod has been running, and the balance can take a decision about like, uh, is my deployment spread? So, and that's one profile. Each pod runs through every profile and uh, if there is, if the profiles are different, so the, the first profile can have uh, can filter specific pods, and the next profile can filter other types of pods. So that's that's the idea. Um, the discheduler uh, subproject is uh, looking is uh, asking for use cases. So if you have any more uh, use cases for descheduling. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the Discaler framework, you can find a link down there to the original design. Uh, the next project is the Scheduler plugins. 
uh, this is a repository out of tree. Uh, uh, so um, there is basically one cube scheduler in Kubernetes, but we wanted to give uh, the opportunity to the community to uh, be able to incub incubate uh, certain plugins um, with uh, with as uh, a high quality uh, as possible, so um, that's why we introduced this this repo. And there are quite some uh, experimental and also quite pr uh, production ready uh, plugins in here. So this is a s kind of like a staging uh, sub project. If uh, if uh, a plugin uh, matures enough, we will consider the uh, upstreaming it to Keep Scheduler. Uh, but it still needs to go through the through the production well the cap the cap process and production readiness um, reviews. Anyways, I want to highlight uh, the, the the plugins that there are uh, are there today, uh, starting with the most popular one probably the cost scheduling plugin, which offers uh, uh, all or nothing scheduling scheduling a group of pods at the same time. Um, I've been told that uh, by the contributors that uh, OpenAI is one of the users of this of this um, plugin. The next one, maybe you've heard of it, is uh, no resource topology. It's about uh, adding topology awareness to scheduler uh, topology inside the node, like uh, Numa nodes, for example. Um, capacity scheduling, uh, it's about elastic quotas, uh, preemption toleration, it's a variation on the preemption uh, uh, plugin that offers certain um, uh, opt-in, opt-out opt uh, capabilities. And this, the next one is Trimaran, as it's actually a set of plugins which uh, are kind of load aware um, scheduling uh, plugins and uh, the network aware scheduling plugin as well. Major changes in the, the last uh, few months, um, a new component config API, several updates to the no resources, no resource topology, topology match. Uh, now there is a scoring strategy, a uh, new scoring strategy for least number nodes. And there is an implementation of reservations that aims to reduce conflicts with kubelet. Uh, and the APIs for pod group and Elastic Quota now serve the status, so uh, you can subscribe to those events. Uh, and uh, more importantly, there are breaking changes in the, next, the newest release. Uh, we changed the API group uh, into uh, scheduling.xkubernetes.io. So if you upgrade to the newest version, you will have to uh, update your CRDs. Um, yes. Okay, the so next project is about uh, the Kubernetes scheduler simulator. So it can help to simulate the Kubernetes scheduler without a real cluster. So more, more importantly, it can display uh, scheduling decisions in detail. So the major changes in the last release is about we can display the scheduling results across all the extension points. So, but, but in the before, we can only support filter and score extension points. And uh, one thing I want to mention here is uh, Simulator has a web UI, but up to now, we only support filter and uh, score extension point. For other extension points results, you have to refer to, you have to, refer to the pod annotations. And the next, uh, we, are cons we, are, we, are, we are trying to implement the scenario-based uh, simulation and uh, benchmark. You can refer to the cap for more details. So this is the general how it looks like. So we can see we have all the extension points, scheduled results in the pod annotations. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the next project is about COG, Kubernetes without a kubelet. So this is a new project. It's a toolkit to build up a cluster and it can create thousands of nodes in seconds. It's, it's lightweight, it's fast, and it's also flexible. So from the test, from the test report, it can maintain uh, thousands of nodes and hundreds of thousands of nodes, uh, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of thousands of pods per laptop. It's quite a large amount of resources. <laughs> and uh, more information, you can refer to the blog. Uh, we are happy to announce that we just released the first version. And we have 
uh, beyond 1,000 GitHub start right now is quite popular. So the, uh, uh, actually, the architecture of the clock is not quite complex. There is no kubelet, there is no node, there is no data plane. So all of this will be mocked by the uh, clock. So to achieve this, clock has two controllers. The node controller and the pod controller. The node controller we are responsible for simulating the node life circle, and it also maintaining the uh, node heartbeat to the API server. Mm -hmm. For pod, uh, for pod container, it's responsible for, for simulating the pod life circle. So you can uh, mock any node, any pod, and uh, at, at any at any status at any time. It's quite flexible because it can achieve this because in Quark, everything is API objects. Yes, Quark, has all, uh, Quark also has a client tool like uh, Quark Control. It's as friendly as uh, can. So we think Quark can cover several use cases like the uh, scheduling simulation. So one interesting thing here is the uh, uh, schedule simulator is planning to integrate with the clock. That's quite interesting. And for scalability tests, if, like if you want to have a performance for like uh, 5,000 nodes, you will no longer need a 5,000 real nodes. You can, you, you can use clock to and build up them and build up them in your laptop. And also for integration with the cluster auto scaler, you are no longer need to jump to the uh, cloud providers. You can build, build, build up them in your laptop also. And yes, functionality tests. If you are developing a CRD and you want to uh, verify whether the CRD behaves well, so you can use Quark. Okay, pretty much for this session. And I guess someone must be uh, interested with like joining the community. So if you are a beginner, you can refer to the first school issue or have wanted issue. And if you have any question, please join our Slack. We are all there. And also we have a bi-weekly meeting. If you want to get more involved, you can talk with uh, like the uh, tech leader, the coaches. And uh, yes, we have an APEC meeting for the contributors from other regions. Uh, if you want to uh, know more about the architecture of the uh, schedule, or you want to know how the uh, features are designed, you can refer to the CAPS and the development docs. So last but not least, thanks for all the contributors in the last race. And yes, we are calling out for reviewers. Thanks. So it's the last part, Q&A. Any questions? Yeah, question. Uh, yeah, Thanks. So, uh, thanks for the great presentation. I wanted to ask about the features that uh, allow delaying uh, scheduling of pods, so the scheduling gates and the suspended uh, pods. So, is there some sort of status condition or timestamp where this status changes to pod becoming schedulable? I'm asking because, mm -hmm. uh, for example, in auto scaling, the scheduling latency is, is a major thing we monitor. And I'm wondering, if, if there is now a bit really long time where pod scheduling can be delayed, is there, is there a way for me to actually monitor uh, the, the actual sort of pod yes. going through the system? There is a pod condition. Uh, with I, if I remember correctly, it's called schedule, scheduling gated, so that it contains a timestamp. Mm, but uh, yeah, you will, you will have to subscribe to that to be able to measure, like measure SLOs, right? Or SLAs. Um, thank you, that's, yeah. that's great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes. I just wonder if there's a, a strategy or plugin which allows to put pods dense on nodes so that uh, they're not spread across nodes, but that we, that we utilize the nodes at the maximum point. Yes, uh, that's one of the modes for the, uh, no resources, no resources utilization <laughs> plugin. Uh, I don't remember the name at this time, but y uh, you can configure it to uh, 
target uh, ma maximal utilization uh, or min minimal utilization for spreading. Uh, the default is minimum utilization, so mm. by default, kubescaler spreads. Yeah, that, that's, that mm -hmm. can be a problem because then you get underutilized nodes and mm -hmm. they cannot scale back because the, node, the yes. pods are pinning the nodes. Yes, uh, uh, so some providers, uh, you know, in GKE we provide uh, multiple scheduling profiles. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you can basically select the scheduling profile that fit, uh, fits your use case better. Okay. Um, Thank you. So that, that's, that's the, the recommendation for cloud providers. To, to provide. Uh, one of the back. Uh, a follow-up question to that. Um, how does it compare to the descheduler? It could also help with maximizing bin packing, right? By clearing out yes. Um, Unutilized nodes? No, it's not about cleaning up. It uh, the question was about scheduling. Add scheduling time to maximize utilization, uh, and the I guess the benefit about doing it during scheduling time is that well, there is no preemptions, no disruptions to the pods. But of course, yeah, you can still pair, you can still deploy together scheduler and descheduler for maximum um, defragmentation. Hi, <coughs> thanks for the talk. Uh, question about Q. Uh, so you mentioned that decision is made on the higher level uh, for the job itself. Basically, decision to schedule or not to schedule is done on the job. How then preemption works? Uh, so yes, yeah, so that's uh, based on on the suspend field of the the job. Uh, the job job API has a suspend field uh, that uh, Q leverages to. Uh, either start or uh, preempt a job as a whole. So the, the, the point here is that Q takes the decision at the job level and then it's the job controller that uh, actually executes the deletions and then Kubelet handles the graceful termination and so on. Um, so basically the, the approach we've taken in Q is that anytime uh, upstream Kubernetes doesn't work for us, we go and change it. <laughs> We talk. We talk to SIG apps. We talk to um, to SIG apps scaling to a, uh, any SIG node, and we work with them to uh, to make this communication channel uh, or this uh, like separation of concerns uh, work work well with us. So uh, as a result, we might have a little of a slower release, but uh, we are here for the long term. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, and and you can also refer to this session. We uh, presented yesterday about the queue and the more detail about the preemption. Yeah. Thanks. I for sure will review it. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>